Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Thursday edition of Benzingo's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Dennis Dick. The earnings parade is continuing today, folks. We'll cover anywhere from 10 to 20 earnings reports. I wrote down the big ones, but I'm sure there's more that you'll have for us in the chat. Uh, Sarepta, T-Mobile, Qualcomm, Abbott Labs, Duo Dynamics, American, American Express, Sherwin-Williams, Kinder Morgan, those are just a few of the ones reporting. Plus, we have the big reports tonight, Microsoft, eBay, and Visa. We'll try to cover as many as we can. We also have Draghi speaking at 8.30. That's sure to move the market. Uh, gold, we're going to discuss that. And um, I know Dennis was talking on the pre, pre-market show about stocks that enter the S&P 500 and why that doesn't move them as much as it used to. So we got a lot to cover. One guest for you today, that's Greg Harmon. He is the founder of Dragonfly Capital Management. Dennis, how was your evening? Uh, not too bad. Just, uh, well, you know me, I'm trading in the evening. There's earnings season. I don't really leave my desk. Obviously, we close at 8 o'clock on the equity, so that's when my night ends. And watch a little bit of TV, put my kid to bed. That's about it. So, so. so for pretty much from like the close to 8, you're glued to your desk. An earnings season, yes. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, you can start to, you know, take off around 6.30, 7 o'clock because earnings start to slow. I mean, the big hour is 4 to 5. You've got earnings flying in there, all kinds of action, you know. And I like to trade the events a little bit, you know, sometimes trade the something place, sometimes trade the earnings itself. When I feel like there's an overshoot, you know, I will, you know, end up trading that. Like American Express last night. American Express got the pop and the drop, and I've traded American Express before, and I looked at the report, and I was like, you know what? It's been going straight up. I was like, it's a good report, but it's not a great report. I talk about that all the time. I shorted it when it was trading higher, and I was actually able to cover it uh, below $84, so you know, or below $85. So I was able to make a buck and a half or something off of that pop and drop. So there's good opportunities after hours. There's a lot of risk. But, you know, you've just got to, you know, feel it's all about tape reading really after hours and reading the tape, reading, you know, your montage, which is, you know, your level two quotes, feeling, OK, well, I think institutions are coming in here. I feel like, oh, there's an iceberg here. Some institutions selling here. It might be going the other way. It's reading. It's all about tape reading. That's all the earning skill is. And that's, you know, 17 years of trading. I feel like I can tape read pretty well. And that's why I can make some money during the earnings events. Well, I guess, well, since you brought up American Express, let's get to the numbers. Q2 yeah, EPS a buck 47 versus a buck 44 sales of 8.3 versus 8.2 billion dollars so they beat on the top they beat on the bottom like you said good but but not great and that's what i was looking at i already had my plan of attack i already thought okay if american express pops and the new earnings are just good but not fantastic i might sell that pop and that's what i was doing so i can't remember the exact prices i got but obviously i got short of american express above I believe that eighty five ninety three close, and I was able to cover under eighty five bucks, so a buck or a buck and a half I made, which was a nice little trade for me. All right, uh, I mentioned at the top uh, we got a lot of earnings to get to, and we also have uh, Draghi at eight thirty, uh, and you want to get to uh, the S and P five hundred and new stocks that enter and why they don't yeah. move it. So we got a lot to get to. So where do you want to start, Dennis? Let's start with Sarepta. Okay. Everybody is talking about Sarepta. I had this in my investment portfolio as a spec play once, and I sold it. I wish I still had it because it's now up over forty dollars. SRPT reported last night. Spencer, give us the details. Sarepta reported there after. Uh, the Bell Q2 adjusted EPS of a 46 cent loss versus a 91 cent loss estimate. Sales of 35 versus 22.38 million dollars. So a good uh, Q2. They're also raising their fiscal year sales outlook. Uh, it was 105 million dollars. Now it's 125 to 130. Yeah, impressive move here for Sarepta. Obviously, this morning uh, with the stock trading up, it's one of your biggest gainers. It's up 17% here now. It's been clinging to the 40 area. I mean, there's a psychological level here. First of all, if there's options, I believe there is. There's going to be you know $40 probably be some open interest at that price. So not surprising that sometimes these big hole numbers act like magnets. And really, in this morning's trade, and even last night, you kind of saw it hanging around this $40 area. Kind of, it was climbing last night. You kind of thought that's where it was heading. So now that it's there, it's 4011. I think, you know, 
the trade for me, at least uh, from the after hours perspective, is uh, you know it's kind of went to where I thought it might be going. Now it kind of sits in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you can say there's a magnet trade of 40. We do have a big option expiration coming tomorrow. Sometimes those you know can be pesky and they can hold the stock there for a day or two as those options obviously and the open interest there can have an influence. But 40 bucks is a big number for, it, and that's where it's hanging out. Uh, all right, let's move on to, I guess, T-Mobile is a big one on my radar this morning. Uh, TMUS reported yesterday as well, Q2 EPS of $0.67 cents for $0.25 cents in the same quarter last year. Sales of $7.445 versus $6.888 billion. So a good sales number. They see a Q2 total sales, uh, $10.2 billion versus $9.81 billion uh, estimate. And they are, again, raising their fiscal year outlook. It's a nice pop. It's up two bucks. Um, it was up significantly last night, too. 75,000 shares, nothing to sniff at, you know, when you're looking at the pre market volume. But it's coming into a psychological 64 level. It kind of jumps out to me that level. If you go out, just look at the last four months, you can see back in May we bottomed after being above 64. We bottomed a couple times right around 64. 63, 63 was the low. Then we cut through it, and then we struggle at 64. Now we get back up to this area where we struggled at 64, and I kind of look at it and say, okay, I see some overhead supply back from May and June when a lot of people were above this a buy that's above 64, it makes me think it could stall out. So I think 64 is a level of significance for me, and I think you got a little bit of overhead supply, so I'm a little bit skeptical that this thing's going to keep climbing. Uh, what's the status of, of that T-Mobile Sprint merger? It, was that just chatter? I'm trying to remember now. Uh, that was just trader chatter or if it's actually a thing no it was chatter okay. and sprint obviously nothing's materialized i don't believe from this um but sprint has obviously had some significant moves and the big thing this would be for sprint i mean sprint has moved up since 2016 it's moved up from three to nine it's been some big moves there's been some spikes in the charts there has been uh, chatter that t-mobile might acquire sprint or somebody else so sprint is still potentially in play here but nothing imminent i don't think yeah okay it just crossed my radar because I, I remember reading about that uh, last week. This is why we have Joel on the show because he remembers everything. He that remembers guy's got everything. Like a, he's got the memory on him. Me and Spencer are a little bit of the goldfish memory, oh, but yeah. Joel remembers stuff. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm staring at my news feed all day, and a headline comes comes across, and I read it, and then it you know it's gone, and the next one's up, and that one's. So oh, yeah, I know. We moved on. <laughs> I only have room for three for like three headlines in my brain at a time. So <laughs> I already said, you know, there's so many so many things your brain can hold. So when you you know you put you know a hundred new headlines in there, well, the 101, the one you got before that, has to go out because you can only hold so much information in there. Right. I, so yeah. and I'm the same way. It's so short term. You know, as a day trader and a scalper more than anything. Is I'm looking at the headline, I'm trading the headlines, I'm making the trade, and I'm moving on. <laughs> and and then I'm trying to remember, you know, Joel's asked me about a stock trade I made last week. Well, I've made like three, four, five hundred trades since last week. So I, sometimes you remember the really good ones, but for the most part, they go in, you know, and then they're gone, and I don't remember them after a day or two. No, that, that's the way it is in, in, in other things, too. Like last night, I, I, I tried to watch House of Cards. I figured it, it's been out for a few months. Let me watch the latest season. Oh, wait, I don't remember anything about last season, and then I w <laughs> tried to watch it, but then I fell asleep, so I actually went, went – I made negative progress last night in my effort to watch House <laughs> of Cards. Back I went backwards. Longer. I'm now further – I'm further away from my goal. I had to do the exact same thing because uh, when season five came out, I watched a little bit of the first episode. I was watching with my wife, and I was like, you know what? I don't remember what was <laughs> going on here, and I'm kind of lost. So we were on to season four right. and watched a little bit of it too. So we're all caught up now, though. We actually just got two episodes to go, so no spoilers from anybody in the chat. <laughs> but it's been good so far, and obviously I got two episodes less left in Season 5. Okay. And we'll find out what is happening in the Underwood world. All right, don't, don't spoil anything for me yet. Let's go over to, to uh, Qualcomm. They reported uh, as well. Let me pull up the, uh, the chart there. Qualcomm reports Q3 uh, adjusted EPS of $0.83. Cents. That's a $0.02 cent beat. Sales of 5.4 versus $5.26 billion. Uh, as far as Q4 goes, the EPS coming in lower than the estimate. $0.90 cents was the estimate. 75 to 85 is the range that they see. Sales estimate, $5.5 billion. Sales guidance in line, $5.4 to $6.2 billion. So uh, mixed on the guidance and uh, mixed on the or beat on the earnings. 
has not been performing great from a fundamental perspective for a long time, but it's one of those value tech stocks. Dividends, 4.09%. I feel like that dividend gives it a cushion always. So when this thing sells off a couple bucks, I feel like there's value investors buying it below just for the dividend. So, I mean, you got the wild card that they could start to pick it up and get some growth again. So it's kind of one of those value tech stocks. I don't have my invest portfolio. It's been on my radar. It fits my description of what I like because I like dividends. But I've just, you know, has had some issues there for a while. Has not has been an underperformer too when you consider how well the Nasdaq has done in the last few years and really Qualcomm's gone <clears throat> nowhere. So relative strength is just terrible here on this one. So I'm still out on it. But at that being said, I think, you know, as this thing sells off, I think you find buyers below. I don't see see this one as a stock that's gonna go down, um, that's gonna move down significantly just because it has a bad earnings report. Uh, any, any levels I put up the 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 one year daily chart right now, which comes out to me, I, maybe this all just... those all those lows just recently in the fifty four fifty five yeah. area. So you can go fifty four seventy three, fifty four seventy eight, fifty four fifty five. Those are the lows from June and July. So I mean we're about a buck above that right now. If for whatever reason we really started to pull back and get back down to those lows, I think we were a little bit lower after hours last night. That's you know something to think about. But that being said, I like I said, I think there is you know some by or there's some underneath demand i will say below just because of the dividend yield something you were talking about just before you know we talked about a stock like qualcomm which has been around for a long time um you were saying you know and all the indices are now making new highs you were saying also wanted to see that finally making a new all-time high uh just yesterday was uh the nasdaq uh, it yeah in, in yep the, yep the it sector uh, it is finally, it, it took 17 years, but it's finally higher than it was during the dot com. What stocks are in that index? Uh, it, it's, it's your big tech. So this is the IT sector. This is Apple, yeah. Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Visa, Intel, Cisco, Oracle, IBM. Those are your top 10 holdings yeah. uh, as of the end of June. Um, so it's big tech. So, you know, it makes sense. But I, I thought I saw that and I thought it was It was the funny. stat. So it made a new, it made a high of what back in the year 2000? Give us all, give us the rundown. It made a high. Yeah, let me pull it up right here. It made a high in on March, uh, March 27th, 2000 of 988.49 was the index. Uh, yesterday, it closed at 992.29. So it took 17 years and change. But it's but you got your money back. You got your money back. So when you bought that multiple, and I believe the Nasdaq was trading with the P multiple of like fifty back then, and I don't know what the IT was, but it goes to show you you gotta watch. You know, valuation does eventually matter on some stocks. And when you know you've got you know in the tech bubble and you had some you know stocks trading you know with you know, no multiples at all because they weren't even making money, so you couldn't even value them from a multiple perspective. Um, it was, you know, a lot of stocks, like I said, back in, then even Walmart was trading with a P of 45. I believe Microsoft's P was 70. So it's taken a lot of years for all these stocks to come back. And, you know, they finally have. But it was basically just got overdone on price. It wasn't that the companies performed bad in the last 17 years. The companies performed great. They've increased earnings significantly here. But what happened was you were just paying, there was people paying just simply too much for the stock's earnings potential. And it took 17 years for the stocks, the fundamentals of the stocks, to catch up with price. So that's the classic bubble. Now, it's completely different here. People are trying to say and compare the bubble of today and saying this is a bubble, you know, in the mar markets here with the bubble of 2000. There's no comparison whatsoever. I mean, the multiples here are high, but they're nothing like they were in the year 2000, you know. So I would say, you know, when you're doing that comparison, I don't agree with it at all. Can we continue to go higher here? Absolutely. Is there anything like the bubble, you know, that we were back in 2000? No. The bubble in 2000 was crazy. The tech bubble. So... You know, that being said, markets can get frothy. Markets can correct. Are we a little frothy here right now? We're going straight up for a bit, probably. But I'm not calling this a bubble. Uh, yeah, I, I I think I would agree with that. Let's move on to More earnings. Uh, Spinner in the chat is bringing up uh, uh, energy. So let's go to uh, KMI because they uh, they reported there uh, yesterday. After right after the bell, let me pull up the number here from and KMI. Did, yes. uh, Fourteen cents versus a fifteen cent estimate was KMI revenue three point three six eight billion versus a three point one two billion dollar estimate. So they beat the EPS. I'm sorry, they beat the revenue and they missed the EPS. Did a Kinder Morgan. Uh, they also issued uh, some. They're raising their their dividend from twelve cents a share to twelve and a half cents per share, uh, and that's pretty much it. 
energy stocks have started to show some life here over the course of the last month, and we've been talking about them. Oil, you know, if you just want to go to the classic USO, has bounced back from the lows, which we had just in June at 865. We're up at 974. We're quietly up about 15% here in oil just in the last month. So it has bounced back from the lows. Kinder Morgan's obviously participated in that rally to a certain extent as well. If you stick those two charts on each other, the USO and KMI, they look very much the same. So Kinder Morgan getting a little pop off the earnings, but I will tell you, for any oil stock, it's really, in the long run, is really where oil is. That's what matters. So their individual reports will make some oscillations. They'll, you know, pop or drop on their individual reports. But when the dust settles, they're really going where oil is. So when you're buying Kinder Morgan, you're buying a play on oil. And it's the same thing. You know, this is a smaller company, though, 2.5%. It's, it's, well, it's a fairly large player. But, you know, when I think the big powerhouses, I think of the Exxon Mobiles, and I think of the Chevrons, I think of the ConocoPhillips. Interesting enough. The big guns have not bounced back as much as some of the smaller players here. Check out the chart of ExxonMobil. We're trading at $80.85. Well, in June, we get down to $79. we are only up a buck and a half on ExxonMobil's, where you've seen a KMI run of 15%. You're, you're not going to see as much run because the beta is lower on ExxonMobil. But ConocoPhillips is a good example, too. I mean, that's not very far off. It's lows. So, you know, the, the big guns are telling you a little different story. They're saying that, okay, yeah, they're happy that oil is starting to go up here again. But nobody's flying into these stocks. And ConocoPhillips yield is 2.5% here. We know they cut it there last year. Chevron yield is a little bit higher. CVX, if we look at it, it's 4.14%. Just kind of hanging out here at the lows and not really bouncing overall with oil, which is a little bit concerning. Uh, but, you know, understandable because they're such big companies that they're not going to bounce as much as some of the little ones. Uh, let's go back to the earnings parade. I'm looking at Alcoa. AA reported there. What happened? I thought Alcoa was always the first person to first to report. What happened to that? That's no. I know now. Then now it's not even. It used to always be one of the first companies, yeah. and they used to always say Alcoa kicks off earnings season, and then they stopped saying it because nobody was caring about Alcoa anymore. Same, and now yeah. it seems to be the big three banks that always kick off yeah. earnings season: the J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. And now you look at Alcoa and the reports the next week. Okay, so give us the numbers on Alcoa. Sixty-two cents versus sixty cents, so a two cent beat. Uh, sales of two point three two three billion versus two point eight five, so a pretty sizable miss there. Uh, billion dollars that is uh, on, on the revenue. Um, they also they they are raising their uh, fiscal year forecast as far as uh, global aluminum demand growth, um, but the stock was trading down. Yeah, and classic scenario here that we've just been talking about. The stock is up 20% in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 trading sessions. So basically since June 22nd, we bought up at 29.66. We're up to 36.50. We already had the run-up in earnings. It was already priced in to have a, a good report, and the report wasn't that good. And you said they missed on revenues too. So not surprising they would give back a little bit of the gain here. Train down a buck in the pre-market. I own Alcoa in my investment portfolio. It's been one of the worst investments. I bought Alcoa back... Oh, man, probably like 10 or 12 years ago, and maybe even more than that. It might have been like 2002, 2003. I've had like 14, 15 years of my invest portfolio. It's, you know, it used to pay a little dividend there. It didn't pay that. Um, then it spun, and Alcoa became Arconic, and then the Alcoa operations themselves. So they just did that one two, or just uh, you know, a year and a half ago when ARNC came into the play. But, you know, when I add up the ARNC and the Alcoa, I still don't think I have my investment money back. I think I was averaging around 35 bucks on the two of them combined, and then they did the whole split, and it was all. So, in any, in any regard here, Alcoa has been a dog for a long time and one of the dogs of my portfolio. Because when I look at my invest portfolio, I've had a lot of stocks in there for a long time. I'm up on, like, most of them because, you know, we're at all-time highs. Alcoa is one that is still in the red. Uh, what about... Uh, I, I want to bring up steel stocks now, steel dynamics, because steel, steel stocks had a bit of a good day yesterday uh, after uh, U.S. and uh, Chinese officials finished their uh, some economic talks that they were involved in. I think the whole sector yeah. was up. Uh, looking at STLD, they reported yesterday uh, after the bell, uh, Q2 EPS, 63 cents. That's in line with the estimate sales of 2.4 versus $2.39 billion. So pretty much the street nailed it as far as the estimates here i mean we've been talking about steel for a while here now we've talked about u.s steel um saying you know that it's been forming a nice base around 20 and slowly trying to climb and it seems like you know just every day you know it tries and then it comes and then it comes back in and tries and comes back in a little bit it's been a slow grind here for the last month and a half trying to get up in that gap area 
but it's trying to do it. And if I just talk about the gap area, I'm talking about when it had the big fall. I believe it was on guidance when it went from thirty dollars and six cents back in April down to twenty four thirty seven, and then closed that day down to the twenty two handle there. Well, finally, we're starting to get into that gap area here. And we always say when a stock gets in the gap area, it goes down quickly through an area. Sometimes it go up quickly through that area too. So we're getting into the gap, which gives us a little bit of hope. We got a big psychological twenty five level coming up. But you know, I don't own U.S. steel. I own new core. It's the only steel stock I have in my portfolio. I still think NUE is best of breed. That's why I have that one in my portfolio. Plus, NUE gives me a nice dividend of still two and a half percent. You know, I like my divvies. But you know, it's in the gap area. If I, you know, I'm making a bull or bearish call here, I'm still be bullish to U.S. steel. Uh, I think NUE is due to report this morning, but I haven't. It is. But I haven't. Yeah, seen and it. usually comes out at eight thirty. So when you get that number, you know, it's going to come out at the same time as Draghi. Let me know. I'm always curious. That's one I've had in my invest portfolio for a long time as well. All right. Let's get back to the earnings, though. Someone still, still Dynamics was the one we actually talked about. Yes. I didn't give you a level uh, STLD. So STLD had the big run up there, too, ahead of the report, even yesterday. And like you said, it's pulling back a little bit, a little bit of a disappointing report. It's down at buck here. But, you know, that being said, lots of underneath demand here because this thing has been trading for a while between 32 and 36 bucks, 32 and 37. So I think there's some buyers below here. So I'm not coming in here selling Steel Dynamics this morning because they disappointed a bit. Uh, Linda bringing in uh, ABT Abbott Labs. So let's look at that one. Q2 adjusted EPS of 62 cents that beat by a penny. And sales of 6.6 .6 for $6.63 billion. They are, however, raising their outlook for the fiscal year. Uh, adjusted EPS for the year was $2.40 to $2.50. Now it's 243 to 253 So they raised it by $0.03 cents on the top and bottom end of the range. I'm going to the book because this 50 looks huge to me. I'm just looking in the book for the first time right now to try to see if there's something up there. Oh, the book's already filling up. i got to think there's the size of 50. Because it's a big psychological level. Multiple times was trading there at 50 this morning. I did trade above it a little bit of 50.05. But I think 50 is the bogey for this. If you can take out 50 and start thinking higher. But I think 50 is going to be initial resistance. And I wouldn't be surprised if it struggles to get through that area. All right. Uh, what, what else we got going on as far as earnings? We got through a lot. Oh, how about Sherwin Williams, SHW? They I just covered my short, actually. Just covered. Okay, well then, oh man, you're good. You're trading while you're Yeah, talking. you know what? This was trading up six bucks last night ahead of the report. I was like, hell with it. It's a, it fits my description of a stock that's been going up into the report. I mean, really, since April, we went from 310 to 360. So I was looking at it last night. I shorted it when it was up it was up around 365 last night trading on the report i was like it's giving me a five or six point lead i think it might you know my buddy uh just up was pointed out too so thanks to him um you know and um obviously it worked out because i was shorting it just because the run-up i thought they were gonna have to blow it away for it to go higher and it really worked out in my favor because not only didn't they not blow it away they lowered guidance Wait, so that's the stock's trained down I, I don't really see any trades the shw yeah and I, I'm on a uh, here. It's a lot of lots because it's a three hundred dollars stock. It's trading three forty one right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, right. That, give us the numbers. The number is Q two just EPS of four dollars fifty two cents. I don't have an estimate for you. Sales of three point seven four versus a three point six seven estimate. They are, however, cutting their fiscal year uh, outlook. Uh, the EPS from continuing operations was cut by uh, about a buck thirty. Yeah, so like I said last night, I shorted this ahead of the report just because it was, for one, it was tacking on six points after hours, which I thought was a nice lead. But the main reason was it's had such a run up in the earnings that I thought they were going to have to blow it away for it to go higher. So I was like, I'm going to you know, just take a chance here that they don't blow it away and maybe the stock can come down and then they lower guidance for me. So it's a bonus. So stock's down 19 points plus the six I got last night. I just made 25 points on this. So that was a nice little trade. Uh, for me here this morning i just covered it just uh, just under 341 here so i'm out right now um but stocks trading 340 341 um looking at it here now i mean obviously i just covered so you know i was looking at this 340 level as a target here this morning just because that's where your resistance was in may can it continue lower here sure can it continue higher sure it's kind of in the middle of nowhere for me now but happy that it was bit up last night and happy to cover it here for some profits this morning all right, I'm looking at BK, uh, Bank of New York Mellon. They reported Q2 EPS 88 cents that beat by 4 cents and sales of 3.96 versus 3.89 billion dollars. So a beat on the top and a beat on the bottom for uh, Bank of New York. 
and Bank of New York is just trading only 251 shares for this morning, so very light. Uh, give us the numbers once again. Just how, how, how much did they beat by? They beat EPS by four cents, 88 versus 84. They beat the sales. It was 3.96 versus 3.89 billion. So, okay. So, so you know, that's good beat. Yeah, good beat. Is it is it enough? Is the question. I mean, you've got overhead supply here. The high uh, just from three days ago, 53.54. I see some sellers coming at 53.80 and 53.90. Going to the buck. Sometimes it's good to go to the New York buck and see if there's anything kicking around in there. Bringing it up, I see ten thousand shares up at fifty-four. I see another fifty or five thousand shares at fifty-three seventy-five. That could be significant enough to hold it down. I mean, the volume's only two hundred fifty-one shares here this morning, so I'm going to say there's resistance all the way from fifty-three seventy-five up to fifty-four. Uh, we're almost through my list of stocks I had read, written down for earnings. Let's you are I. Let's talk uh, United Airlines. Yeah. Okay. You and are... it's getting a nice four-point pop here again. The stock has been a monster too. I mean, really, when you think about, um, you know. Well, I guess, you know, the car rental's been tough, but this is equipment rentals. This has been unbelievable. Stock, just to even go out to the weeklies or the monthlies, if we go back in 2011, this was like a $15 stock. Now we're talking about the stock at $121. Just incredible movement here. Um, it's come back to a level of significance. I'm going to say lots of overhead supply up here, though. Around 125 at lots of highs in March and April. I think that could be where it might put a lid on it. Uh, if we does decide to take that out, the all-time highs way up at $134.28. I think that's out of play here today. But stocks and favorites been running up a little bit here. Uh, but I'm not going to chase it this morning. All right. Well, here's the number: uh, Q2 EPS two or adjusted EPS two dollars thirty seven cents. That's an eight cent beat. Two twenty nine was the estimated sales of one point five nine seven billion versus one point five six. So they did beat that number as well. They're also raising their guidance for the fiscal year. Sales forecast: They're raising up by 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 about. Uh, it was 6.05 to 6.25 billion was the uh, previous forecast. They're up by about a quarter billion, uh, a quarter million, sorry, on, on the low end of the range. And uh, URI, what, what what do they do? That's equipment rental. Okay, I I, I knew that. I was just testing you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, All so right. we did say that off the hop. But a lot of people think, you know, they see rentals. They're like, oh, is this car rentals? It's no. not. It's equipment rental. That's that's a big difference. That's why it's performed so much better than like a Hertz. I used to actually trade, you know, you think rentals, rentals, you know, maybe, you know, URI goes with it too, but it's not the case. Speaking of Hertz, though, I mean, this stock is one that's obviously been killed. It's been Ubered, you could say, where everybody says, you know, they've been Amazon. Hertz has been Ubered, but holy cow, Hertz has been a monster here in the last month. This stock was Ooh. eight bucks. It's doubled. It's doubled in what? one month. So, incredible movement. I mean, this is probably a short squeeze from hell for Hertz. HT Zebra trading up a little bit here again this morning. 18 bucks looks huge to me on Hertz. It's been, it's been moving up here. But, I mean, it's a rocket ship right now. So, where the rocket ship runs out of gas is always the question. Why not 18, though? That's what I say. Well, okay. So, when, when was this 852 low in Hertz? That was on June 21st. Okay. June 21st. One month later. June 21st. That was... Uh, I'm trying to find when the Uber CEO resigned. Uh, well, that was around that time, because I know he took his leave of absence, like the June. There was some. Uh, wasn't there somebody else getting a position in this too? And again, goldfish memory for me and Spencer. So Chad, if you can enlighten us here, somebody got active in this, didn't they? Like, I mean, is, Car- is Icon still in? Oh, it? oh, 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 jeez. Oh, Icon yeah. was in it for a while too. Yeah, he was. He, I, he's not anymore. I, is he I, out? I'm I'm almost positive he is. He out. didn't sell at losses though. I'd be surprised. Here, here, I kind of like selling at losses. Here, He's old school. Yeah, you know what? He's like I had the losers. Let me see. Uh, he's got deep pockets. It works, but oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm Icon. sorry. I doubt he, Icon's out. He's not. No, he no. I'm wrong. Losses. I'm wrong. No, he's not out. He's not out. Uh, there was actually a rumor back in May that he could acquire the rest of hers he doesn't already own. Uh, he he had a fifteen um, percent stake. Um, in, in in November, and so that's that's, not so that, that's what he's at. That's what he's at. Yeah. So, and he he is one of those old school traders, you know, the big money guys that doesn't sell at loss, and also adds to losers. And these are, you know, obviously two rules that I, you know, say do not follow this. It's for deep pockets only. People who can afford to eat huge losses. But you know, there's some rich people out there, and Carl Icahn is one of them. And that has worked for him for a long time is adding to losers and 
um, you know, just having the deep pockets to hold on until they come back. So Hertz coming back for him lately, though. Wait, but this is interesting. Back to the Hertz chart. So this low at age fifty two was the twenty first. That was the day that uh, Travis Kalanick resigned. The CEO resigned at Uber. So since he resigned, Hertz has has more than doubled. It's impressive. Interesting. All right. Uh, it's an impressive move. That's been a big move for Hertz. All right. What's uh, the other one? Uh, Car. Yeah. How's it doing? A- Avis. How's Avis? It's come back a long ways too. Twenty two bucks up to thirty two. So it's up fifty percent. So it hadn't been killed as much as Hertz either, so it makes sense that it wouldn't bounce back as much. Very interesting move there. Um, Let's look at the balances. Sure. Before. An eight thirty. What Joggy say? Oh, Market's popping low. Yeah. Joggy must have. Said I don't honestly. I've been, I've been too busy, too busy looking, looking at Hertz. I'm not sure uh, what Joggy's saying. Help that Brentster guy. Brentster I, knows. I, I think I think Brent's a little bogged down with with ratings right now. But I'm 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 gonna you do balances. I'm gonna go find what Joggy's saying. Okay, Alibaba. For the umpteenth day in a row, it's got a buy and bounce of 58,000 shares. I mean, this is just a stock that continues to have a buy and bounce every single day. I don't know when it's going to stop having buy and balances, but that's the trend, and the trend is your friend. And if you've been buying, selling the close and buying the open, you've been making money on Baba a lot of days because a lot of days it opens higher than the previous close. Morgan Stanley, 30000 to sell. AT&T, 146000 to buy. They were all loving it on Fast Money last night. They really got the Fast Money pump, and I actually watched AT&T climb just because they liked it on Fast Money from 36.14 up to 36.30. That's why it's trading up a little bit here this morning still. And there's some institutions saying they like it too with 146000 to buy. Um Hewlett Packard, HPQ, 32000 to buy. I believe there was an upgrade from RBC on that one. That's why that's trading higher. Nike, 69000 to buy. Nike's got some analyst action, too. Big note for Morgan Stanley last night, raising it up to overweight. And that's why the Nikester is catching up bed. They're saying, buy it now before it's too late or before you miss the train or something like that. It was an interesting note from Morgan Stanley on NKE. Stock trading up a buck and a half in the pre-market. Uh... G fifty eight thousand to buy U.S. Steel X sixty one thousand to buy. We were just talking about that. Visa thirty four thousand to buy. That reports tonight. Sometimes you see those pre earnings run ups, which we're seeing a little bit this morning in Visa. So there's a few interesting ones out there. Draghi has not started talking yet. So, oh, it's late, late to the mic. Yeah, it's late to the mic. But uh, back to the imbalances for a quick second there. So, and you mentioned this at the top, but I was talking about this yesterday uh, with someone uh, here uh, at Penzinga about this. So, you know, if you you've observed that Alibaba, uh, we've observed now they have a buy balance pretty much every day. Um, I guess, like, talk us through why uh, why would the institutions want to show their hand like that. Well, you just have – well, there could be a number of reasons. You know, Most of them don't. Okay. That's why you really see the imbalances change between 928 and 930 because they don't want to show their hand. They don't want traders stepping ahead of their orders. Um, but sometimes you know, maybe you just got an institution that just wants to say, I think Bob is going higher. You know the pre-market traders are going to drive it up, you know, and maybe they're showing it intentionally. Maybe they just don't care. Maybe they just want to buy it at the open. I don't care that everybody sees it. I know there's going to be liquidity providers that come in to help me, you know, and liquidity providers being short-term traders, being high-frequency traders, being anybody that's going to sell into that imbalance. So sometimes it's just advertising, you know, to the markets that, hey, I got a big chunk to buy. Do you want to sell it to me? So it's almost like, you know, just advertising out your order. So, you know, I, I don't suggest doing it. If I was an institution, I would be holding my uh, cards tight to my chest, just like most of them do. But, you know, as a trader and as an opportunistic trader, short-term trader, this is market-moving information. I'll tell you, you know, other things being equal, though, there's no news. You got a big buy balance on a stock that comes out at 8.30, stock will move up right at 8.30, start moving up, because then people are now speculating that it's going to open higher. Yeah, like I said, these numbers change significantly always before they open because you have more institutions that are going to come in. But there's been a trend for Alibaba to open higher, it seems like, every single day. And it seems like this institution that keeps buying you know, is, is there almost every day. Or at least there's somebody there every day that's got a buy and balance on it. And when I see a trend like for seven, eight, ten days in a row, I tend to think it's probably the same player. So how do you make money on that information? There's a number of ways. First of all, if you think there's going to be a buy and balance there tomorrow – you buy the close and sell the open because if it does end up with a buy in balance, it's going to end up opening up. So you're going to make money on it that way. Second way to play it is just maybe at 8.30 when you see the big buy in balance come out, you jump in you know, and maybe buy you know, along with it. 
you know, because that's going to move it at 830. Uh, third thing is sometimes when you see too big of a buy imbalance, it's actually a selling opportunity. Maybe a stock's going to open too high because it's just too big of a buyer at the open. That's going to push the price maybe out of range, maybe give you a short opportunity into shorting the close. So there's a lot of different strategies, but you got to weigh everything else too. You got to weigh other information. Is there an upgrade or downgrade? Is there an earnings? Is there, you know, information in the sector? Is a market way up? Lots of different factors, but it's one more tool in your toolbox that's telling you about order flow. And order flow is what moves price. Well, Drogny has stepped up to the mic, and we're going to step away from the mic. We're going to go grab our first guest, Greg Harmon, founder of Dragonfly Capital Management. Welcome back, everyone, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Dennis Dick. We're on the line with Greg Harmon. Greg is the founder of Dragonfly Capital Management. Greg, how's it going today? It's going well, guys. Well, we are trying to keep one eye uh, on Draghi as he speaks right now. Uh, how, how's your morning going? Uh, or t- Talk us through sort of like your, your morning routine, uh, generally speaking. Uh, you you wake up and and what's your routine like as far as the markets are concerned? Well, you know I've gone to bed with a with a particular view, uh, seeing that uh, things were uh, up strongly yesterday and uh, you know, things like uh, the IWM, the Russell 2000, yeah, setting up for a, a possible major breakout. So I, I looked at that a little more closely this morning. Uh, Take a, a quick look at uh, any trades that uh, may have uh, earnings implications coming up. Uh, like today, uh, I own positions in uh, Microsoft and Visa, so I'm taking a look at those. Uh, and then for subscribers, I'm taking a look at those uh, potential earnings trades as well to see which ones set up to be um, ones that we might be able to uh, enter into on a uh, low risk, uh, high potential reward profile. All right, so actually, I'm glad you mentioned two of those stocks. Uh, Microsoft, they report uh, tonight. So, so w- let's talk about that. Uh, what, what is your, your thought process there for, for entering, entering a trade, uh, you know, the, the day of earnings, and do you plan on, on holding it through or, or getting out before or, or what? Well, when, uh, when I look at Microsoft, I, I think uh, two ways on this. Uh, one is uh, that uh, recently it's broken out of a very long-term um, pattern so that uh, it's a, it looks like a, a long-term buy. So then you get down to uh, earnings and say, is there an opportunity to get into a trade here uh, that allows you to take advantage of a, a long-term hold but at a better price because uh, perhaps it's moved too high uh, initially or is there a cheap way to take advantage of a short-term move uh, based on uh, increased levels of implied volatility growing into uh, the earnings report. I look at the, what's happened since uh, the beginning of July, and it's up, you know, almost six bucks. So, you know, just under like eight uh, percent in uh, two weeks, so or three weeks. So maybe a little bit uh, too far, too fast. So uh, I would take a look at uh, something like a one by two put spread, buying one put and selling two lower cost or lower strike puts uh, at levels where I might be willing to enter the stock. So. You know, maybe something like a 72 by 71 by 2 put spread so that uh, if it drops back to 70, uh, I would be able to uh, buy the stock or be put the stock at a price of 70, but with a basis of uh, 67 and a half on it. And I look at those types of trades uh, where uh, that one by two structure uh, doesn't cost any money or pays me a small credit so that if I'm wrong, uh, there was uh, no harm in, uh, in looking at the trade. That's that's Great. one way to look at. It. And the other way is, well, what if it keeps running? Because you know this market seems to just go one way, just up. 
Uh, and that uh, perspective makes me take a look at something like uh, maybe a call calendar uh, that, that says that after uh, this long run, you know, maybe a big number with big open interest like 75 might stall the stock uh, this week. So I could take advantage of uh, that by selling the 75 call in July, uh, but buying the 75 call in August or September or some outer month so that uh, uh, any kind of short-term noise or pullback uh, uh, makes it so that uh, I don't have to um, be short in stock, but that uh, in the long term after Friday, I'll be uh, long calls free and clear. Greg, this has been the play here for a while in this market just to buy the dip. I mean, every time some of the majors pull back, it's just been a buying opportunity. Even the recent pullback, you know, when we had the Citron fall in NVIDIA and Apple got hit 10 points and, you know, Microsoft got hit. They all got hit hard that day. Here we are a month later and buy the dips. Buy the dippers win again here. Um, you know, I've been in the markets for 17 years. I know that isn't always going to be the case, but man, for the last three, four, or five years, if you've just been buying the dips, especially in these momos, you've been rewarded here. How do you know, like, when, you know, is the time maybe to be cautious about buying the dip? Like, what signs would you look for that maybe, you know, this isn't working anymore? Or, you know, or do you just keep doing it until it doesn't work? I think that that's what you do is you just keep doing it until it doesn't work. You know, for me, that means, you know, how do you define it doesn't work anymore? Well, um, yeah, the price action starts going uh, lower, confirms uh, a trend reversal by breaking through a major level, uh, has uh, a majority of uh, indicators also pointing in uh, an opposite direction. So the things like momentum indicators uh, looking to turn bearish, uh, volatility indicators all pointing down, things like that. Uh, and we're just not seeing that. You're right. We haven't seen that for many, many years. Jump over to a few other stocks on your list, and Amazon is one that's obviously buying the dip, has worked continuously in this too, made new all-time highs again yesterday, making new all-time highs again this morning. It's just like Groundhog Day around here. It seems like that stocks go up every day. Amazon, AMZ brand, what are you seeing in the technicals? Yeah, I mean, uh, yesterday, you know, we're the day before, breaking out over uh, like 1018 area. Uh, as a, a major uh, breakout to the upside. And if it, uh, it holds this level through Friday, so we get a weekly print uh, up there as well, you know, we could see uh, another sizable run to the upside, you know, maybe another $100 out of the stock before uh, we get a pause. Wanted to ask you, wanted to ask you Greg, about uh, J&J. There's another one on your list there. They, they dropped it a little bit uh, after the earnings, but it's up uh, since then. What are you seeing there? Yeah, I think that uh, that earnings drop was, uh, was an opportunity to get in. And uh, we bought uh, calls, <clears throat> excuse me, we bought calls uh, uh, that morning uh, and uh, have been you know, doing fairly well with them so far. Uh, if you look at the, the technical pattern there, you have, you've had uh, an ABCD pattern that's played out since uh, you know, roughly February, yeah, the end of January up through uh, the top that happened in uh, the middle of June. And now, uh, we're reversing up, up again, so that ABCD is starting to look more like a three drives pattern, uh, which would say that uh, you've had two moves higher, so let's look for a third move higher. And with the, the moves being you know, roughly uh, about 18 points, you know, from 132 at the bottom here, you've got the target of 150 on it. Wanted to ask you about uh, Conagra. Uh, you know, another another rumor yesterday that they may or may not be be approaching uh, Pinnacle Foods. We, we had that report from Faber uh, about a month ago that those talks were done, uh, but it seems like chatter that it's still going on. So, uh, what do you see there in Conagra? Well, Conagra, I see is a stock that was be that was beaten up. You know, from uh, the middle of March, you know, the stock lost. You know, down from $42 uh, down to $33. So that's a, that's a major drop uh, in a pretty short period of time. Uh, and, but since then, since the beginning of July, you know, when it found some footing there, there's uh, been some you know, small technical factors that have made it look like uh, there's a, a potential rebound play here. So I, I like this stock just for a short-term rebound. Uh, we bought some calls on it uh, yesterday. Um, the things that I liked about it uh, were momentum had moved from uh, deeply oversold to uh, rising back positive or rising back to the upside, uh, things like the, the MACD indicator, which is what I use, 
uh, crossed up, which is a buy signal. And we've got now um, uh, two high, uh, we've got a higher high and a higher low put in since that uh, low. So, you know, maybe it doesn't uh, get to all that far back, but uh, from uh, a price right here, just under $34 to you know, maybe $37.50, it's uh, good for you know, 10% on a possible short term trade. What about ADSK Autodesk? This one has uh, more or less doubled yeah, in, in the last year. Yeah, and uh, it uh, went through kind of a, uh, a consolidated phase um, uh, as it uh, broke to the upside. There was a gap there uh, to the upside in uh, May, uh, but it has pulled back uh, from that time period uh, over a you know, month and a half, six-week period, and then started moving back higher again. Uh, when it got back over the uh, 50 day, a couple of days ago, uh, it started looking interesting and then it broke above the, uh, late June, uh, bounce high. Uh, we've got, uh, Bollinger bands, uh, that volatility indicator now opening to the upside. We've got, uh, momentum moving back into, uh, the bullish phase. We've got, uh, uh, that indicated by, uh, uh, the RSI and the MACD and, it looks as though we've got the, another run here. You know, when I look at uh, you know, a measured move on this, I'd say uh, we've got you know, something like a 20-point run from uh, the low at the beginning of July. So maybe we see 120 in this before uh, there's any pause. And then uh, I want to ask you about HP. What do you see there in HP? Yeah, talk about beating up sectors. Um, you know, this one uh, in uh, the beginning of December made a high. Uh, what day was it there? December 12th, and has been moving lower for six, seven months since then. Uh, but the, then, uh, just a couple days ago, started moving back up uh, against resistance at the 56, uh, setting up a couple of uh, low or higher lows, you know, making what we call an ascending triangle, and broke that uh, to the upside yesterday. Uh, so we've got uh, here again, uh, momentum is shifting to the upside. It had uh, it moved ahead of price and it was diverging to the upside. Price is joining it now. Uh, the stock has moved over the 20 and 50 day uh, moving averages. And I think that uh, with a um, uh, possible bounce move here, you know, we entered it. We bought some uh, some calls for August in this yesterday and, you know, moved back to uh, the 200 day moving average around 67 is, is uh, a reasonable thing to look for. Alrighty, we've been on the line with Greg Harmon. He is the founder of Dragonfly Capital Management. Greg, thanks so much for uh, coming out today and sharing some of your uh, your trading setups. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, uh, eight. Forty-eight. Uh, I, I want to just highlight real quick. Draghi has been on for the past fifteen minutes or so. Um, S and P futures are reacting a little bit to what he is saying. Excuse me. I just want to uh, really highlight. He's. It seems like what, from what I'm from what I'm reading, he's being pretty dovish here. Uh, so he did say that asset purchases will continue at least through December. Um, Dennis, any thoughts here? Uh, banks, U.S. banks drifting down just slightly here since Draghi's been talking. So, but you know, not a lot of response here. I mean, S&P futures sold off a couple of points. Yeah, the banks trading just slightly in the red. The U.S. banks, the European banks are just slightly in the red as well. They actually were down a little bit more earlier. They've actually bounced back a little bit. Some of the European banks, Deutsche Bank, was down about a dime. It's almost flat here now. But now, nah, you know what? It's kind of been muted activity. It hasn't set any uh, game changers here. Or the S&P futures would be barking one way or another. Okay, uh, where would you like to go next? Jump over to the chat here. Jared was just asking about AMBA. Um, you know, this is a stock that everybody had linked to GoPro a while ago, but it's kind of on its own here now. And obviously, you know, it's been better since it's been on its own. The stock just pulled back significantly from the highs. It's trying to form a bottom here. Um, it's an interesting level. It's trying to form a bottom from as well. If you go to the weeklies, you can see the stock got down January to 46 bucks, And then just recently, we got down to 47 So you could argue that that 46 level has held. And we've been slowly trying to climb from there i mean if we could get up at above the 5260 i think it gets interesting i'm not sure when these reports spencer maybe you'd like to dig into the pro and find that because obviously in earnings season it's going to be earnings that really make this thing move i feel like it's later in the it's very season, late though. it's very late it's yeah. august 31st 
There'll be lots of time with AMBA before worrying about an earnings day. Almost you know five weeks of trading here or six weeks of trading before that. So above fifty two seventy that or fifty two sixty that high from the other uh, from July the fourteenth. I think you know you got some room to the upside in here. It's kind of just in the middle of nowhere. Uh, all right, there is one more that I want to hit, and I, I don't remember what it was. There's a ton on the list, so yeah. you know, it all but, depends on where you want but, to go. But, but I, I, I want to talk about I want to talk about what you said on the pre pre market show, uh, which is you were talking about stocks that get added to the S and P 500, yeah. and how it doesn't really move them as much Not as like it, it used, used to. to. So Not like it used so to. Like so stocks? you had a bunch of stocks get added to the S and P 500 last night. You know, you had some stocks coming out as well. Um, do you have that list in front of you? I have it. If you don't, no, Spencer, I don't. But okay, so MGM going in, RMD going in, PKG going in. They're all up this morning. AOS is going in, and DRE is going in. Uh, last night they all got a significant pop, and then they kind of got the drop, and they were just kind of hanging out, and they weren't really getting. You know, usually when a stock is out of the S and P 500, it's like a three to five percent slam dunk. Over the years, I've traded the strategy for a lot of years. Usually they go in, usually they go up three to five percent. So it's not the case anymore. I don't know why that is, but they haven't been getting the love that they have in the past. In some cases, you've actually seen the stocks go down after it gets announced that they're going to the S and P 500. There was a Reuters article a while ago. I was quoted in it, um, just saying that it was exact facts that before you know historically these moves into the major indexes the stocks would show three five six percent moves and they those moves have been muted as of late i'm not sure why that is maybe this is so many indexes so many etfs up out there right now that are picking up these stocks that it's just not as valid anymore if anybody in the chat knows the reason for that i'd love to know the actual reason but i'll just tell you from my experience in the last year or two um, the stocks that are getting added to the S&P 500 are not moving up as much as they have in the past. They're all up this morning. MGM is trading up this morning, about 2.17%. Full disclosure, I actually have a short position on MGM. RMD is up 1%. PKG is up 0.66%. Uh, AOS is up, and DRE is up slightly here in the premier. Actually, DRE is flat. But the ones coming out here, and those typically would go down, but they haven't been as of late. MNK is coming out of the S&P 500. MUR is coming out of the S&P 500. Triple BY, which is Bed Bath & Beyond, is coming out. RIG is coming out, and RAI is coming out. But RAI is coming out because they're obviously merging uh, with uh, British Petroleum, or with uh, British uh, Tobacco, the BAT, uh, or British Amer or Tobacco, or whatever it is. So... That's why it's coming out, but I don't know. You have seen muted activity and muted moves here. This morning, we are seeing, you know, we saw a big spike in MGM um, this last night off, and the other ones weren't spiking, so that's why, you know, I tried it from the short side up at 30 in the 3390s, which is working out because at 3350 here this morning, just trading the after hours action, I thought it was overdone when it got up near 34. I like the resistance. That's why I was trying it from MGM here. I've still got the position on. I haven't decided where, where I'm taking it off yet. But 34 bucks was a major resistance, and I thought, you know, with the muted activity that's happened in some of the other ads, I didn't think it was deserving that MGM was up a buck 20 on the ad, All which right. is why I tried to short. Let's get to some <clears throat> ratings, some pretty interesting ratings changes this morning. So you mentioned the Morgan Stanley note on Nike. They're upgrading it to overweight. We also had JP Morgan upgrading Royal Caribbean RCL to overweight. We have uh, RBC upgrading HP after uh, – HP didn't report yet, but we've already seen HPQ. Yeah, HPQ. Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, Wedbush upgrading both the Wow Wings uh, from underperformed to neutral. Uh, what else did we get? We got a downgrade from Credit Suisse at uh, on Pfizer down to neutral. We have got JP Morgan downgrading some small energy stocks, uh, Jones Energy, uh, Energen, and uh, Gulfport Energy all getting downgraded this morning. Uh, those are kind of the big ones. Johnson & Johnson uh, got outperformed uh, at uh, Credit Suisse after after their earnings. Uh, what Anything else jump, jump out to you? The Buffalo Wild Wings was an upgrade from Wedbush? It was indeed. <clears throat> okay, no action on this yet. Zero trades yet. It's interesting, though, because this stock has been killed. Maybe, you know, they, can this help it out for a little bit there? Because BWLD is down significantly over the last two months. We're from 160 down to 120. Formed a triple bottom down the 120 area. A little inside day there yesterday. Stock, tr uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this actually did tack on a little bit here this morning. Just because of the upgrade and just because the stock has, you know, started to form some type of a base at least the last three days with the lows at 120. So, I'm interested here in this one. BWLD has not traded here this morning, but... We'll see if I can get a lift here off this upgrade. 
Pfizer is a stock I have my invest portfolio I've had in there for a decade. Sticking with it here. It's getting downgraded this morning at Credit Suisse. Not sure why. Stock's trading down 27 cents in the pre-market. Love the dividend. It's been a good performer for me. Um, 33.84. It's still off. This is one that's interesting. You know, you talk about the tech bubble and talk about the stocks. I don't know if you can go how far you can go back on your chart, Spencer, but I can tell you from my memory, and so I don't always have a goldfish memory. I can remember this. Pfizer used to be a $45 stock, and that was back in the year 2000. We're $33 here now, so here you are 17 years later. Pfizer, one of the big drug companies, still has not got back to its all-time high, which was set back in the year, I believe, 2000, around 45 bucks. What do you have for an all-time high, uh, Pfizer? I, I got a 20-year monthly up right now. The all-time high was 5004 50 bucks. Ago. That, wow. that was uh, April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1999. The drug stocks were all monsters. Like we say the tech bubble, but there was a bubble in the drug stocks too. And I believe the Pfizer multiple was up as 40 or 50 back then too. And you play in 40, 50, when growth starts to slow, this is what happens. And you go into a long period of time where you're not making any money at all. So Pfizer, you know, I'm happy that I actually bought this during the, the financial crisis and I was able to pick it up in the teens. Um, I'm sticking with that. Merck is another one. Bring up the 20-year chart in Merck. You know, okay. people say, oh, Merck's a great stock. It wasn't if you bought it back in the year 2000 because it used to be a $95 stock, believe it or not. 17 years ago, it was 95 bucks. Today, it's 62 So Merck still has not got back to the price that it was back in the year 2000. Although, if you would have bought it in 2000, you would still be out money because it's paid you dividends for 17 years. Probably enough dividends that you've got all your cash back out of the stock as the dividend yield on Merck is still, even at this price right now, 3%. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting trade. If you bought at the low... During the crisis, that was a twenty dollars stock. Um, I picked it up at thirty in the thirties. So okay. I bought. That's when I really built my portfolio was during the financial crisis, and I bought a lot of stocks back then. The companies that I thought were going to still exist because they were throwing companies out like everything that was not nothing was going to exist anymore. And I did pick up Pfizer and Merck during the financial crisis. Eli Lilly was another one that I picked up the big three, and those were all great performers for me for a long time. I still have Merck and Pfizer. Lily's just run so far. It ran so far that I actually sold out of the rest of it in the 80s, uh, I think last year. But you know, it was a great performer for me as well. I was picking these things up with 5 6% dividends, and obviously they've come back a long ways. Uh, all right, 857. Train investing wins again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, eight eight fifty seven now. Got a few more minutes. Uh, any questions from the chat or any uh, anything else on your list, Dennis? Um, well, Spinner's asking about PII. Um, it did report. Polaris did report earnings here this morning. So if you can give us the details sure. on that report, I'll jump into the technicals. I can do that. PII did, did report Q two EPS a buck sixteen. That's an eight cent beat. A buck oh eight was the estimate. Uh, revenue thirteen point six four versus one. That. My might be a typo. I don't know. Thirteen point six four versus a one point two six billion dollar estimate. I don't that might not be right. But uh they did uh they did raise their fiscal year uh outlook as well. Uh the EPS for the year they raised it by about ten cents. It's a big pop for the stock. Stock is trading up four four bucks in the pre market here. Find its home around ninety six and a half. I'll say if it goes in really into rally mode, major resistance up at the psychological one hundred dollar level. Go out to the monthly, you can see in twenty sixteen we got there multiple times, couldn't quite get there in July. And now this is the first time coming back to a big psych level like that. I gotta think there's some resistance up in the upper ninety nines ahead of the one hundred level. Uh, and then real quick, uh, can we get another a final imbalance update? Let's go, Lock. Alibaba's 41000 to buy, so still up. Visa, uh, somebody was just talking about that in the chat. It does report tonight, 58000 to buy, so you're getting a little pre-earnings run. One thing about Visa and Microsoft, both of these stocks have been running up ahead of the report. You know what that means. It means they need to blow it away to go higher. Sometimes they do that, sometimes they don't. If they just come in in line, it's not going to be enough. If they just come in and slightly beat, I don't think it's going to be enough. They need to blow it away to go higher, which is why sometimes I lean to short these things actually going into the reports. It doesn't always work, but obviously it worked last night for me and Sherwin Williams. Uh, just Visa and, and Baba? So, yeah, Visa, Baba, Balance. Uh, AT&T is now 201000 to buy. That's significant. Stock's been hated for so long. All four people on Fast Money last night loved it. I really honestly <laughs> watched it. Uh, it's crazy. They, you know, you can say Fast Money and all this stuff, and you know, some people like them, some people don't. They move stocks, man. Like that AT and T moved up fifteen cents because they all liked it on Fast Money. I watched it. You know, Wait, there was no other reason. Fast Money. After they all liked it, it just started climbing. It's on. It's on. So, a, it's on a fort, right? 
It's five o'clock. Oh, it's five. Oh, excuse me. Five, yeah. Okay. So between five and seven, you've got a lot of influence coming from CNBC because nobody's influence, more influential than Jim Cramer. So when he comes in and covers a stock, you yeah. know, and it's not you know expected, like some of those that he comes on and you know says, "Oh, I'm gonna have the CEO on." Well, you already knew that, so it's probably not gonna pop because everybody knew that. But it's these unexpected stocks that he just covers. You know, usually a couple of features out of the blue. Those right. stocks pop. Big time, you know, it's like an upgrade almost when Kramer comes in and says he likes the stock. So, you know, and features it. You know, not just saying enough that he likes the stock. He comes in and actually features the stock. It moves price. And the fast money guys, they move price too. It's it's, it's crazy. There's a lot of retail traders out there that are actually can move price too. And they all get together, as I, as I heard. Now, you know, I don't know if I jump in here just because, um, you know, I'm actually more of fading, you know, some of these calls sometimes that they make on CNBC. But, um you know, it's just something to be to to know that they actually move price. All right, uh, that is our show for the day. As far as tomorrow, final show of the week, we got Fari Hamzi. Fari has not been on the show in, uh, in, in quite a while. Quite a while. Watch so. Commander. The Watch Commander. Yeah, he hasn't been on the show uh, all year, as, as a matter of fact. So we're gonna get Fari on uh, tomorrow. He's the founder of Hamzi Analytics. Uh, as far as the rest of our show, you can catch it uh, again on our podcast, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Just search for pre-market or just subscribe to Benzinga on YouTube slash Benzinga TV to uh, get notifi- notified whenever we go live every morning. Usually we go live at around 7.50 uh, a.m., about 10 minutes before the show starts. couple of housekeeping announcements for you. First one I've mentioned for the past week or so, we've got, we have the Benzinga FinTech Summit coming up in September in San Francisco. To learn more about that, go to bzsummit.com. Also, there is a Benzinga Pro webinar uh, today at 12.30 Eastern. I'm putting the link into the chat right now. Uh, the jar actually asked about that uh, in, in, in our chat. Uh, there is a, a question that if we ask and the first responder will get a uh, free pro for a certain amount of time. I'm not super familiar on the details, but the webinar is today at 12.30. It's what analysts watch for during earnings season is the topic. So I put the link to the Benzinger Pro webinar in the pre-market chat just now. So that's it for us today. Uh, Have a good rest of your day. Good luck out there, folks, and we will see you all tomorrow. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform. Because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.